and Mr. James E. Mayer. It's my pleasure to introduce the panelists, but I might just mention that this is being aired live on 94.3 KEDM, Public Radio. Again, our panelists are Mrs. Heather Parker, Managing Editor and uh, Evening Anchor for KTVE, Mr. Greg Hilburn, Business and Political Reporter for the New Star, Mr. Bob Lennox, News and Public Affairs Director for 90.3 KEDM Public Radio, Mrs. Adrian Lejeune, President of ULM Student Government Association. I will now turn the program over to our moderator, Ms. Sue Nicholson, who will be the moderator for this and also President of the Monroe Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Tim and Adrian. Gentlemen, please allow me to review the ground rules. Each of you will be given 40 minutes to give an opening introduction. We will then move to the panelists who will ask a series of questions. Each of you will be given two minutes to respond. Uh, the person answering first will have the opportunity um, for a one minute rebuttal. At 6.50, we will end the questions and give each of you three minutes to offer closing remarks. To keep everything on time, we have from the Monroe Chamber, Daphne McLeish, Event Director, and Lori Renault, VP of Governmental Affairs, who will serve as the official timekeepers, and they will let you know when your time is up. Prior to coming on stage, the two candidates drew, um, actually flipped a coin to determine who would go first, and that distinction goes to, which one? Mr. Abram. So Mr. Abram, uh, you are welcome to give your three-minute introduction. Right, glad to be here. Thanks uh, for having us. This is a great venue, a great crowd here that we're looking out at for the viewers that can't see us. I am Ralph Abraham. I am a physician in a small rural community down the road uh, called Michael. Prior to that, I was a veterinarian. I worked uh, 10 years in the uh, animal field before I transitioned to the human field. Uh, I'm a pilot, uh, still an active farmer, uh, and now a father and a uh, Leslie, a grandfather. The question that everybody uh, tends to ask is, you know, why now? Why you? Why are you running for Congress? And the simple answer is, now it's my grandchildren. This nation has strayed so far from where the founding fathers wanted us to go that we're in a bind. And if we don't quickly reverse course, then the generations that are our future for this country won't see the America that we know can be great and good. So we've got to get back to our Christian values, to our founding father values, to our constitutional conservative values. And until we do this, then we are in a state of affairs that is not going to be good for us here and certainly for the future. Thank you, Mr. Mayo. Thank you very much. Good evening. I am Jamie Mayo, and I'm mayor of the city of Monroe. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all those who are supporting this forum tonight. I'd like to introduce my wife, the First Lady, Angela Mayo, and also my grandson who's laying on the floor over there, <laughs> Tyler. Uh, I've decided to run for this office for several reasons, but I want to give three reasons tonight. First of all, all of you know that the city is in the best financial shape in the city's history. In the 13 years that I've been mayor, we have a fund balance or surplus of $14.3 million. We've had a record uh, uh, 10 consecutive years of surpluses, and also we have an A-plus bond rating, which is very significant. You won't find a city, town, or village throughout the state or country that's in better shape. Also, uh, we've created an environment that's conducive to growth for economic development, and also retention. When you look at CenturyLink, when you look at Vantage, Gardner Denver Thomas, and you look at so many other companies, large, medium, and small, we've created that environment. And thirdly, what you haven't heard my opponent or very many other people say, is that I've been able to work across the aisle to bring millions of dollars of projects throughout the city, like a brand new airport terminal, the public safety center, as well as the uh, river market downtown. And so those are three reasons why I'm running, because we can transition all of those successes to uh, being the fifth congressional district uh, candidate if you elect me. Uh, there's no question this this campaign is all about leadership. It's all about leadership and all about success and also about experience. And that is the clear difference between myself and uh, my opponent, in addition to the fact that I will be a full-time congressman if you elect me, a full-time congressman. I don't have any other 
uh, interest in terms of business interest. I don't have a medical practice. I commend him for having a medical practice, but you cannot represent 24 parishes, the largest ge geographical district in the whole United States, on a part-time basis. And that is the significance in this, uh, in this campaign, especially when you're inexperienced and then when you're experienced as I am. Thank you very much. Thank you. And for our radio listeners, you're listening to the 5th Congressional D District uh, debate on 90.3 KDM. We'll now turn the program over to our panelists for questions, and we'll begin with Heather Parker. And Mr. Mayo, this question will be asked to you first. Mayor Mayo, what is your position on the Affordable Care Act? Can it be improved or should it be repealed? Well, there's no question that I've said all along that uh, concerning the Affordable Care Act, there are some great features and benefits in it. The fact that uh, youth can stay on their, their parents' policy until they're 26, that is significant. Also, pre-existing illnesses can be taken care of where prior to you could not be able to do that. Now, uh, there's no question that there are some challenges and there's some issues uh, with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there's a lot of talk about repealing it. There's no way that you can repeal it unless you can override the president's veto, which you will not be able to do, even though the Republicans have taken over the Senate and, and also both houses. So if you have an issue with anything, such as a, a car, which I did, I had an issue with my starter. And so when I took it to the shop, I didn't say give me a brand new car. I said fix what's wrong with it. And that was give me a brand new uh, starter. And that's what we should do with the affordable care act. You don't just tear up the whole thing and try to bring something back which has the same features, or some, some of the similar features in, in it, and also um, add to it. You just fix what's wrong with it. So I do support it with some changes. Mr. Abram? You should uh, come to my practice in Mango on a daily basis, and I can show you the debacle that the Obamacare law, if we can call it that, because it's been changed 37 individual times by President Obama with an executive action. We don't know what the law is anymore. And it's, we cannot write prescriptions we want. I can't get an MRI on a young lady that had a brain aneurysm. It's gotten to the point where our hands are so tied that even to try to work with this law is untenable. Now, Mayor Mayo said as well, it's got some good things and he compares his starter to his car. Well, yeah, but if the motor's broke, you gotta get a new car just because the door open. So, We've got to get this law repealed if possible. If not, we change it 180 degrees because as a practicing physician right now, it's not working, it's even dangerous because we cannot do what we need to do for our patients. Well, first of all, we all know that the Republicans have tried to repeal it countless of times. And they said that they're conservative. He says he's conservative. They've spent over $80 million trying to repeal this law, which cannot be repealed unless uh, you can override the president's veto. That's problematic. And even if you were able to repeal it, you're gonna hurt children, you're gonna hurt seniors, and also disabled. And that's problematic too. Now, let's get down to the level to where the rubber meets the road. You're gonna deal with these children, you're gonna cut the children out. You got 10 million people that's got coverage now. You got over 100,000 people in the state of Louisiana and you're gonna hurt them because now they have coverage which they have not had coverage. And Bob Lennox will ask this question and it will be directed first to Mr. Abraham. Mr. Abraham, March 15th of next year, uh, the current U.S. debt ceiling of approximately $17.2 trillion will have to be addressed. What is your position on that as far as increasing the debt ceiling and why do you hold that position? If we have to increase the debt ceiling, which with this administration we more than likely will because every three or four months we're having to do that. For every dollar we increase the debt ceiling, you show me one dollar of savings of that we can cut. And I assure you, with this administration, it is a lot of waste, very easy to do. So yeah, would I raise the debt ceiling? Sure, but only if you give me a dollar a cut for every dollar I raise. Mr. Mayor? Well, the record would show that the Bush administration 
I increased the debt $7.8 million, which is almost $8 million. And so this administration has a trillion, rather. The, this administration has increased it 5.2. When you look at the debt, nobody likes uh, an increasing amount of debt. You want to do everything that you can to, to address that. And so it is with us, with the uh, city of Monroe. But sometimes you do have to raise the debt civic. That is the responsible thing to do. You don't want to mess up with the treasurer bonds, or you don't want to see the stock market fall, and, and some other things that would take place. We have to pay our bills. We have to pay our bills on a personal level, and we have to pay our bills on a, a federal level as well. And so uh, there's no question that you have to do the responsible thing. Plus, the Chamber of Commerce, so you with the Chamber of Commerce, I believe the, um, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce supports raising the debt ceiling because they know some of the issues that would cause it is not raised. This next question will be asked by Greg Hilburn and it will be directed to uh, Mr. Mayor. Mayor, in 2013, Congress failed to extend several tax exemptions, most of which expired January for the 2014 tax year. Some of those include personal deductions for mortgage interest, some business exemptions, some higher education deductions, and others. Next year, you're likely to have the opportunity to address these to, or to extend them. What's your position on extending these tax exemptions and why? Well, you know, I don't have any issues with extending tax exemptions after I've been able to look at what they're for. You just mentioned some of them. Uh, as long as we're not uh, extending tax exemptions for multi-millionaires like my opponent here and some others, uh, as long as we're addressing uh, some things that need to be addressed as it relates to tax exemption, uh, well, then I'm okay with that. But uh, the, the prudent thing to do is to make sure that you see exactly what those tax exemptions are before you make a decision. That is the prudent thing to do for any administrator. It's a prudent thing to do for any legislator, which uh, I would be uh, when elected as the next U.S. Congressman for the 5th District. Well, I appreciate my opponent giving me a higher income bracket than I actually did, but uh, I'll show you. You're what <laughs> we, we've got to get real about these uh, tax code. It's overcomplicated, and it's outdated, and it's leaking billions in unnecessary tax exemptions. Republican leadership has identified tax reform as an area where America can become great again with a Republican Senate and a Republican Congress who can actually now start moving some bills forward. Uh, last check, uh, last week, uh, Harry Reid had 362 bills on his desk that he hadn't let come through, and one of those dealt with the tax uh, exemption and the tax reform. So we've got to move these bills forward and do business for this country. The next question will be asked by Adrian Lejeune, and it will be directed to Mr. Abram. Last year, an attempt was made to increase the federal minimum wage from $7.25 to $10.10 per hour. That measure failed. If introduced again, would you support an increased federal minimum wage? If so, why? What I believe is it can create an environment where businesses can grow and succeed and they can pay higher wages. According to Cato, which is a nonpartisan limit uh, agency, increasing the limit of the minimum wage actually lowers the minimum wage for millions of people. Also, businesses are going to lay off, so it increases the unemployment rate. So, do business, let competition take its place, and I guarantee you, you'll have better than a $10.10 minimum wage across the board. We've got to have a livable wage for our people, but let's promote business, let's cut some corporate taxes, let's let them reinvest, reinvent, and minimum wages will come up. Mr. Mayor? Well, I think everybody knows that I'm fiscally responsible, and I've been that way for a number of years, and we would not have. 10 consecutive years of budget surpluses and a record $14.3 million um, surplus. And so uh, there's no question that the minimum wage needs to be increased and uh, it needs to be increased. And I would support increases to $10 because we do need a, living, a livable wage and we don't have a livable wage now with the minimum uh, wage the way it is now. Um, way back uh, years ago when the minimum wage was uh, a dollar and something. Some people thought at that time that it was gonna hurt business once you increase the minimum wage. Look where we are now, it strengthens 
business because it affords us an opportunity uh, to not only, not only make a living, but also to be uh, progressive and productive. As citizens, I look at our young people who are in college here and in the university here. There's no way that they can succeed if they're going out to a job and the minimum wage is the only what it is now. So I would definitely support increasing that. And you see where five states just recently overwhelmingly uh, increased uh, or voted to increase the minimum wage. And I think uh, it needs to be done in the state of Louisiana. I think it should be done throughout the country. There's no question about it. This next question, question will be from Heather and it will be directed to Mr. Mayo first. Mayor Mayo, what is your position on the expansion of Medicaid? Well, that's a very good question. The expansion of Medicaid, and I've been very vocal about this. Uh, the 5th Congressional District is one of the poorest in the whole country, and I want to continue to emphasize that. And as a representative for this district and this country, I need to do everything that I can to move this district forward. And one thing that should be done is to have the extension of Medicaid. I, 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 I certainly criticize the governor for not uh, accepting the, the expansion of Medicaid. That's for the working poor. And we have a lot of working poor that's working very hard each and every day in the rural areas. They cannot make uh, ends make, meet. They don't have uh, good uh, health care benefits because uh, they don't have, when the opportunity comes, well, then they don't get it. And then we're paying for it. And then when it goes to states like uh, Arkansas and California and New York, we're waiting for a thank you card. Every time I go to the mailbox, I want to get a thank you card from them thanking us for paying for the huge benefits that they're getting. Look at the um, Arkansas. Look how it's really uh, making a tremendous difference. My opponent, he'll tell you he's against it, but he's made millions of dollars from Medicaid and also from Medicaid. And I think that that's, that speaks volumes of how you have people make so much money off of benefits, then all of a sudden they start running for office, then their position changes. Hmm. Well, you would think if I was uh, against it, or if I was making millions of dollars, I would be for it. But thank you again, Jamie, for upping my income that I don't make. But uh, anyway, I'm You're welcome, Ralph. I am against it. Let me tell you why. To expand Medicaid would take uh, in 500 plus thousand more people. But what they're not telling you, not the Obama administration, is that 260,000 of those would be moved from private insurance groups and therefore premiums go up everywhere. Now, if you look at the DHH of Louisiana, they have projected that in 10 years it would cost this state $2 billion. Now, we're a state that's working on the line here. If we put that money into Medicaid expansion, then we have to take it from universities such as ULM, other programs that are very noteworthy. The mayor said that, well, if you take Obamacare out, you hurt the children. Well, Children are now on Medicaid, and let me tell you, in Louisiana right now, a family of four can make over 50,000 a year and qualify for Medicaid. So the poor families that need the health care, we want them to have it. They can have it right now. It doesn't affect the children. We can't afford Medicaid expansion unless we cut out major, major things in this state. Well, you had three years where you had the coverage. Uh, without costing the, the state of Louisiana anything. So you had three years to plan, and that's what it's all about. The governor took the easy way out by deciding to just go against it because it was uh, uh, political for him nationally uh, to be able to do that. But he's not the president. You know, he's the governor of the state of Louisiana. He's the governor of the 5th Congressional District, which is one of the poorest areas in the country. And again, I go back to you make all this money from Medicaid and Medicare, and all of a sudden, now you're running for office, now you're against it. God sees us all. This question. Uh, both parties agree that America's infrastructure is crumbling. Well, what is one of the first steps that you would take to adequately fund transportation and infrastructure projects nationwide? Well, the Highway Trust Fund hasn't been redirected in about 20 years now. We don't need any more taxes, that's for sure. And the infrastructure across America is failing. Our bridges have an average age of about 32 years right now across the nation, and some of them are very unsafe. The interstate system now is 20 plus years old, and as you can see here in the 5th District, they're repairing it daily. So we've got to redirect funds to a highway trust fund, the infrastructure, the money's there. It's just been taken out and given to other social programs where it was wasted. 
if we actually use the money that was designated for what it was for, use it frugally, it will work every time. Mr. Mayor? Well, again, we all know that um, economic development is very important in jobs, bringing them to our community, our district, our cities, uh, towns and villages is very important. And infrastructure is a very important piece to that. If you ride along the uh, city of Monroe, you see signs of progress all over the city. We've been able to get a number of different projects through our lobbying efforts, our lobbying with the Chamber of Commerce. We work with the business community to get those funds. Now, we also know there's, that there's no earmarks anymore. And so now you have to go through the administration, which means that you have to go to the president to get uh, some of those uh, infrastructure dollars. And you can't do that when you're fighting him on every single thing. He tells you no, just like he told Bobby General, our governor, no, with the um, guide building when we were trying to get the vehicle, he told us no. That was 1,400 direct jobs and 1,800 indirect jobs that our governor cost this city and this region. Uh, Mr. Jindal, our governor, by the way, uh, my opponent is in lockstep with him, and he thinks that the governor should be president of the United States, and that's what he's cost us. A reminder to our radio listeners, you are listening to the 5th Congressional Dis District Debate on 90.3 KDM. And this question will be from Greg and directed first to Mr. Mayo. Mayor Mayo, for the past couple of years, the sequester uh, spending caps have reduced defense and readiness spending. With current national security issues like ISIS, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Ebola, on and on, is it time to repeal those cuts, those sequester cuts? Well, there's no question. Uh, it is time to repeal it because all of those cuts across the board have caused a lot of challenges and issues uh, for the country, which ultimately is, has caused some issues for us as well. We just cannot take all of these cuts that the Republican Party uh, is behind that's causing true damage to the country, uh, trying to uh, appeal to the American people as if they're uh, doing the logical and prudent thing to do, but it's hurting people. Now, we have to be prudent, and we have to be very comfortable in terms of how we deal with the budget, the same way that we've done with the city of Monroe. You know, we, there has to be a combination, of course, of um, revenue enhancements as well as expenditure reductions, and that's how we've got to where we are now. But you just can't cut your way to prosperity. The sequester does need to go for a lot of reasons, but mainly if you look at the uh, bill itself, what it did is inappropriately or disproportionately affected our military. And with the things that uh, Greg mentioned, ISIS, Ebola, the border situation, our military is becoming even more important on a daily basis. So. Uh, one thing the mayor and I probably will agree on is that the sequester probably wasn't a good idea and we need to fix that. This next question will be asked by Adrian and it will be directed to Mr. Adrian. What is your position on equal pay for women and why? Equal pay for the same job you met. Uh, let me tell you, I fly with a lot of uh, women pilots. I practice with a lot of women <coughs> positions. They probably need to be paid more than we do. But for Equal pay, equal job, sex, gender, race should not matter. It should, it should be equal across the board, simple, period. Mr. Mayor. Well, obviously, I support equal pay for, for women, and my record will show uh, my support of, of women in the workplace. Uh, you won't believe this, but when I became mayor, there had never been a female that served in the capacity of a department head for the city of Monroe and very few as a division head. So that's ludicrous. It's unconscionable to think that that has occurred um, in, a, in a city our size for all those years. So women have been just looked down on, and that is a shame. Uh, not only equal pay for them, but equal opportunity in so many different areas because they are very smart. Uh, Heather will ask this question and it will be directed to Mr. Mayor, Mayor, what is your position on immigration reform and 
Well, immigration reform is right upon us. Um, we do know that the president uh, will be giving his address tonight in a little while concerning that. Now, I've heard the president say, and I already know this, that there was a bipartisan bill in the Senate that was passed. And then it went over to the House, and then the Republican uh, leadership did not bring it out for a vote. And so the president has said that he wanted Congress to address um, immigration reform because we know that it's broken and needs to be fixed, but it would not occur. I've seen him say that on countless times, that that, ne that needed to be addressed. And so there's been a lot of conversations about it. It's been at the top of the agenda for this particular race, and it needs to be addressed. And he's pretty much given a timetable when he wanted to address it, but the Republican Party did not want to address it. And so he's indicated that he would use executive power to be able to do that. And that's what he's he's doing. The borders need to be fixed. Uh, the, there certainly need to be immigration reform. But if you got a bipartisan agreement, a bill that's passed, which is very difficult to do uh, in today's society and in Congress, and then you won't have a party uh, leader uh, like uh, Congressman Boehner that will not even take to a vote, well, what else can the president do? Well, I think the president is speaking, as we're speaking here, actually, that uh, he will um, probably propose what they call delayed reform, which means he's going to put off until the spring of what should have been done years ago. It wasn't. So to answer the question, no answer, that's easy. Still the borders. We need legal immigrants for this country. That's what made this country great. We still need them to run our farms, to run our manufacturing, to run our businesses. Those people that are coming in legally are mechanics, machinists, doctors, lawyers, we need them. But for those illegals, five plus million now that are here, because the border has not been sealed, we don't know who they are, what they are, and who they represent. Starting with this Ebola and other diseases, we don't know if they got what they're coming across. So, no amnesty, seal the border, Bring the legal immigrants in, the illegals, they have to do it the right way, the legal way. This next question will be asked by Bob and it will be directed to Mr. Abraham. Mr. Abraham and uh, Mayor Mayo, uh, something you gentlemen probably have heard a little bit about in the past couple of days here, the Keystone XL pipeline. Uh, the president is said to have a dim view of this uh, legislation. Would you support lobbying the president to back the XL pipeline, Mr. Abraham? Definitely. We should have got that, that Keystone pipeline here years ago. It would be create immediately 40,000 jobs, but the president opted not to. So now that it came up for a vote just yesterday, it failed by one vote in the Senate. But let us turn the calendar to January. I guarantee the Keystone pipeline will be approved. We need it. We need the jobs. We need the oil. We need independence from other countries. We need to allow our oil and gas to export to Europe, where Putin is holding Europe in its grips because of the winter. So yes, the Keystone Pipeline is not only vital to jobs, but it's going to be vital to a national security issue. Mr. Mayor. Well, contrary to popular belief, where some people have labeled me as uh, supporting the president on every single thing. This is one area that I don't support the president on. I do agree with my opponent here that uh, the Keystone Pipeline needs to be uh, addressed, it needs, it needs to be passed. I was very unfortunate that it failed by one vote in the Senate. And it will create uh, just unbelievable amount of jobs uh, for the country and also for the 5th Congressional District, which is so badly needed. This question will be asked by Greg Hilburn, and it will be directed to Mr. Mayor. Mayor, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa this past year has placed greater emphasis on global pandemic preparedness. In your opinion, what can Congress do to prepare for pandemics and to protect American citizens? Well, first of all, uh, what Congress has to do is the same thing that the administration has to do, and the same thing that I do here in Mayor as mayor is you have to depend on your your people that are working very closely with it and make sure that you have the proper information i've heard some people say some opponents say that that you need to make sure that you cut off flights all the flights from africa and those type of things and you can't do that without having all the information 
I had the opportunity to uh, be on a conference call with the president, and he had all of his uh, key folks on the conference call, as well as the uh, uh, specialized folks that deal with these type of, of issues on there to give us a briefing in terms of um, uh, what they were wanting to do. Of course, this is a political season, and of course, everything that comes up is the president's fault. But when you're in that position as an administrator, you have to make the best decision that you possibly can based on the information that you have. If you have good information, you can make good decisions. If you have bad information, you're gonna make bad decisions. On the legislative side, as a member of Congress, I will understand that I have to listen to the experts that's, um, uh, that's working with this in terms of trying to come together as party lines on the legislative side in addition to the administrative side to make the very best decision such that we can protect the American people. Well, I haven't talked to the president, but I have talked to the CDC and Atlanta on the Ebola things as a physician. And let me tell you, they have not done a good job. You do restrict the flights from those countries, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Liberia. That's the way you control a pandemic, is you treat it as a source. Again, let's go back to the border situation where we have people coming over. We know the incubation is 11 21 days. They could come over very healthily. And in two weeks, we could have another Dallas and Houston event. So yes, you do stop the flights. The president is not listening to his good advisors. They have told him these same things. So the way you control, and like your, your question, Greg, was how do you handle the pandemic? You treat it as a source. You don't let it get out of this captured area. You seal every board you can, and then you kill it, the virus where it lives. It's not hard to do. I've been to Africa, and it could be done. Well, when you are, when I'm flying to Washington, uh, maybe fly to Atlanta, then I maybe fly to Washington, or if I'm from a smaller area, you may have two or three stops that you have to make before you get to your destination. So again, not having all of the information is very diff difficult to say how that needs to take place because what all are you gonna restrict? Because all of those are not direct flights. And so, but when you have that information, you can, you can make a good decision like this. And you said that you hadn't talked to the president, but you just made a comment concerning uh, something that the president said. And this question is from Adrian and it will be directed to Mr. Adrian. What is your position on net neutrality and why? I'm against it. The internet was started by private businesses. Again, this is, would just be another example of overstep by the government trying to control business, and it never works. Look at the economic debacle that we're in in this country now because of government overreach is reaching into our this is our privacy with the NSA. Look what government overreach has done with the Poor Veterans Association. Our poor veterans are, did I give the example of government overreach of the Veterans Association. So, get the government out of our business, I'm against net neutrality, let's do what they do best, and that's make money. Mr. Mayor. Well, um, you know, again, I've heard a lot about government overreach and so forth. I, I, I was an insurance agent and I understand standards and guidelines, I understand regulations uh, as it relates to uh, government and, you know, this overreach thing. There are reasons why government has to do certain things, whether we like it or not. Uh, there are reasons. We're, we're in a litigation society and uh, we can't stop that. I remember the time when uh, we used to write a lot of insurance when I was in sales, but then they there was some quote unquote overreaching of standards and guidelines um, that were put in place because of losses, and you have to do that. So we don't like some of those things, but those are some things that have to take place. Allow me to remind our listeners this debate is live from the Student Union Building Ballroom on the ULM campus. This is the 5th Congressional District Debate on 90.3 KDM. And this question will be asked by Heather, directed to Mr. Mayor. Mayor Mayo, last year, Ben Bernanke, former chairman of the Federal Reserve, could not refinance his mortgage. His response was that perhaps Congress has gone too far in regulating banks and financial institutions. Has Congress gone too far? Well, 
Congress has not gone too far when, the, again, the standards and guidelines are in place and you don't meet those. Uh, there's a quote unquote underwriting procedure uh, that's done as, as it was done when I was, uh, I was an underwriter. There's standards that's put in place and you have to meet those. Sometimes when you don't meet them, it depends on who you are, there's an exception. But I don't think that there should be, quite frankly, exceptions unless there's extenuating circumstances. So I'm sure that there were reasons why he could not do, could not refinance. And so um, that's why those standards and guidelines are in place. Mr. Nicholson? Well, of course the government's gone too far. Let's look at Dodd Frank. Your community banks are having to buy or compete with national banks. It's not a level playing field. The reason Bernanke couldn't get a, a loan was because he had failed one little check in one box, if you look at the report that was put out by Newsweek. Your bankers now, their hands are tied, just like our hands are tied with Obamacare. A banker now, certainly in the community level, like OIB, Cross Keys, any of the local banks here in Monroe, can't make judgment decisions. They may know you, they may think you're the best person in the world, and they know you have the ability to repay. But because of Dodd Frank, they can't give you the loan because every box is not checked. So, yes, the government has overreached again with the Dodd Frank and has made dis discretionary lending a passe, a thing of the past. We need to get back to that. We need to throw Dodd Frank out and let our bankers do what they do best. They know how to lend money. They're not going to make a bad loan if they think they're going to lose money. I mean, they're going to do business. There are some examples. I can think of one example when the government is overreach. Uh, when the Republican Party shut down the government, uh, there was overreach causing thousands of folks to uh, not have a paycheck. Uh, that crippled the uh, uh, economy in a huge way. This question from Bob Lennox, and it will be directed to Mr. Abraham. Mr. Abraham, given the revelations last year regarding the NSA and the increased number of retail and banking cyber attacks, in your opinion, how can Congress balance providing security for Americans while at the same time protecting our privacy? I don't want the government in at least my life as, as least as possible. But uh, let's talk about cyber attacks. We have to be proactive on that because if we wait to be defensive, we're so far behind the curve. China has got a unit of their army that sole purpose is to conduct cyber attacks, mainly on America, of course, but Europe. And unless we stop that, unless we plan for it, unless we budget for it, then we are going to get hit. And the, the report out today from the government that said that within 10 years, probably every country in the world will have a major cyber attack. China, of course, is the one that uh, everybody picks on, but Iran, is very capable, as is Syria and any other countries in the Middle East. They all have special units that their only job is to break into our national security system and shut us down on a power grid, uh, whatever you want to call it. it, it it's a real thing and we need to be ready. We have to do everything that we can to make sure that we support uh, these issues against cyber attacks and also crime. Uh, as a country, we know that we're very vulnerable and we need to make sure that we do everything to make sure uh, that we, um, to make sure that uh, when we have these uh, attacks, that it doesn't cause our economy to have a meltdown, which it, it could. So Homeland Security, we have to be cognizant of uh, what we do in that area. Okay. This question will be asked by Greg Hilburn, directly first to Mr. Mayo. Mayor Mayo, uh, we talked earlier about the possibility of raising the debt ceiling and when, when in those discussions, it always seems like there's followed by people that advocate for entitlement reform. Uh, in your opinion, some issues with uh, the conversation of entitlement reform because people feel that um, folks that have worked very hard for so many years should not be entitled to certain benefits. They've worked hard, so there's a promise that at the very end, that certain things is going to take will happen, like Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid that type of thing. So I think that, uh, you know, people look at that and say, well, we need to change it. We need to change it because there's a perception that a certain uh, demographic 
uh, of getting most of it when that's not necessarily the case. So the talk about entitlement reform, there's always uh, some issues, some challenges as it relates to uh, some problems that you may be having uh, that need to be looked at. But I don't think that there needs to be any wholesale uh, reform as it relates to entitlement because there are people that have worked very hard and there is a promise that they've been made that need to be um, dealt with. Mr. Well, most of our seniors, of course, depend on Medicare. We have a lot of our poor, and even some of our Medicare, unfortunately, depend on what's called TANF, the Temporary Assistance uh, Fund for Needy Families. These have to stay intact. Now, as far as the uh, entitlement reform, we've got to stop the spending. It's not a revenue uh, problem in this country. This country makes plenty of money. It's a spending problem. And yes, we do have to cut back on some abuses. The question was asked, what agencies could we reform? Certainly the EPA, the NSA, the DOE, and I, the list goes on and on. So yeah, we can reform them, but or as far as the Medicare, the TANF fund, things that protect our people, they stay in town. And this will be our last question. It will be from Adrian, directed first to Mr. Mayor, Abraham. In front to Congress, what is your what is your greatest concern and your top priority for the two-year term? Well, there, I don't know if there's one top priority. There are, there are many. Of course, the spending has to be curtailed. Our borders have to be sealed. Our military has to be shored up. We have to start finding jobs and good jobs for our people. So all of these are priority items. Where do you start? When you start at the top, whichever one pops up first, that's what we're going to hit. And we're going to hit hard running, and we're going to make it work with a Republican Senate and a Republican House. We can push some bills through now. The 362 bills that uh, Harry Reid has on his desk, we'll move them on now. And we'll get an up or down vote and see where we go from there. Mr. Mayor? Well, as I said before, uh, when we opened, uh, that um, one of the things that we've done in City Monroe is we have created an environment that's conducive to economic growth and retention, and we've done that in the City of Monroe. And when I transition to Congress, we'll do the same thing. Jobs, economic development, that's what it's all about. And that environment has to be created to be able to do that. We cannot forget about not only the urban areas in the 5th Congressional District, but also the rural areas. And so that is first and foremost. And of course, there are other priorities, but that's the number one you ask for one. But I do want to say this, that the 5th Congressional District has never had a comprehensive plan. And that is the, one of the first things that I would do if elected, is to put together a comprehensive plan. By the way, which is the same thing that we did uh, in the city of Monroe. We call it the city of Monroe, one um, city, one future. And what we will call this is the 5th Congressional District, one district, one future. And we'll bring everybody together. We'll bring Northeast Louisiana, we'll bring Central Louisiana, and we'll bring the Florida Parish to, together. Because by the way, the Florida Parishes, which is way down south, they feel left out. Now we've had congressmen that have worked hard and worked on different issues, and I want to applaud them for some of the things that they've worked on. Our Congressman McAllister is here tonight, and I know that in the year that he's been here, he's tried to work hard on different things, but we need a comprehensive plan. You have to have a roadmap to be able to be successful. And we have a roadmap in the city, and that's why we've been successful in several several areas, and we will have a roadmap for the 5th Congressional District. Thank you. And let's thank our panelists for doing such a great job. I'm going to ask each of our candidates to offer closing remarks, and you will have three minutes each. And Mr. Mayo, we will begin with you. Well, first of all, let me start out by thanking the panelists and all those who uh, put this on tonight. We really appreciate it, and also all of you who have attended. But I want to start out by reading from the News Star this uh, editorial that was in today, today's paper. It was talking about the debates and how valuable that role is. It says here, and I won't read the whole deal, it says the 5th District deserves a strong representative. The district needs a strong voice for the many in poverty, for those seeking employment, 
The district needs a representative who has the respect of both his constituents and his peers and Congress. And I think the only thing that's not in here is that uh, the New Star is not saying we recommend Jamie Mayo. <laughs> because I believe that that is wholeheartedly what I stand for. You know, I've been a strong voice, and people know that I don't go along just to get along. A party lines, I work across the aisle. I made Democrats mad at me. I made Republicans and Independents, but I work with them as well. I do the right thing. I don't let labels define me in terms of knowing what needs to be done. But the successes that we've had in the city of Monroe is unmatched, quite frankly. Being in the best fiscal shape in the city's history and creating that environment, the corporate headquarters of Central Link would not be here had we not done that. They were a very good company when we came, but they're an awesome company now. Being able to re retain businesses like Garden Dematama, they were about to move, and we put together a blue ribbon package to keep them here. St. Francis Hospital was about to move, and I've offered them a proposal that they've accepted they're going to stay downtown, and a number of others where that have occurred. So I've, sh I've shown strong leadership as mayor of the city of Monroe and also as a city council member, and I will show strong leadership in Washington, D.C. When you're fighting the president for the next two years, and he's the president of the United States, you're not going to get anything done for the 5th Congressional District because he has to make the decision about projects in this district. We will not be one of the poorest in the country if you elect me. We've done it for Monroe, and if you elect me, we'll do it for the 5th Congressional District. I grew up in Humble, beginning. I was poor. I was on welfare, a product of welfare. I also was born in a charity hospital at Conway. So I know what it means to be poor and to not have anything, and not to have food on my table. I don't have airplanes like my multi-million dollar uh, opponent. <laughs> in fact, I, we've had to walk a lot of time. I drive a 10, almost 10-year-old 10 vehicle, well, almost. And so those are the things that we need to be able to relate to the common people, and not just representing large corporations and giving tax breaks to these folks and forgetting about those people who need it the most. God bless you, and may God keep you in the city. Let me uh, address a couple of these darts that uh, the mayor's thrown at me, the part-time deal. Obviously, the mayor doesn't know me. I do nothing part-time. He obviously hasn't been to my clinic. He knows we've got uh, four wonderful uh, health care providers that, in my absence, will do a wonderful, wonderful job, probably a better job than I will have done. And also, on the uh, Governor Jindal thing, uh, it was Governor Jindal that uh, brought CenturyLink to this uh, country. He's kept him here. He came up when Gardner Dillard Thomas was just to leave, cut a deal, which allowed him to stay. So yeah, the governor has just already done some missteps, certainly with the health uh, retirement and the teacher and the charity hospital. I totally disagree on those things with him, but he's done some good things for this region. He's done some good things for the fifth district. I'm not a politician. I grew this medical practice in Mangum from a little trailer, and we work from can to can. Diane and my wife work seven days a week sometimes, 12 to 14 hours a day. So we know what it takes to grow a business. We've grown four of them. The mayor kind of puts a jab in for having an airplane. Well, that's what you can do when you work 12 hours a day and you're very frugal. My wife watches paper cups that we reuse, so we know how to save money. And when you do that and you work hard, you are able to buy things that, that help you in your business. And we have an aviation business, by the way, and this is why we have an airplane. So it's actually a business tool. So the things that create business we need to get back to. The things that divide the mayor and I are very wide. I am pro-life. I am pro-gun. I am pro-business. I am anti-Obamacare. These things give the voters a very clear choice. The mayor has attached himself pretty much to <coughs> President Obama. He just said that uh, we've got to win in two more years and accept it. No, we don't. These are things that we have to fight because they're wrong. And these are things that we have to defend ourselves for. That's what we do as Americans. When there is a wrong, we stand up and correct it. And if we don't, then we become just another socialist country. We're not gonna allow this to happen. 
So we've got to get back to basics. We've got to get back to Christian values. We've got to get back to constitutional conservatism. And we've got to get back to fiscal responsibility. And by doing these things, we have a wonderful, great nation that, again, we can once again be proud of. I am Ralph Abraham, and I ask humbly for your vote on December the 6th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And to our co-host, the ULM Student Government Association, the Monroe Chamber of Commerce, KERD, Fox 14, the New Star, and 90.3 KDM Public Radio. This has been the fifth congressional district debate with candidates Ralph Abraham and Jamie Mayo, uh, which you've been hearing tonight on 90.3 KEDM Public Radio. Thank you to our audience and to everyone who has tuned in. We remind you to vote on Saturday, December 6th, and we wish you a good night.